by the way, for this Hamiltonian, of course, you have a unitary evolution which says that trace rho, which is equal to trace rho square, which is equal to 1. Get it from just considering trace of this matrix and matrix square. The first is conservation of probability, and second one means the unitary evolution. There is no dissipation. And number five, parameterize your density matrix since you have a conservation of probability such a way that nx is equal to two real part psi up, psi down, ny is two imaginary part psi up, psi down, and nz is psi up modulus square minus psi down modulus square. And after you do that, you should obtain that this equation of motion for the density matrix is the block equation for unit vector. So this is what I suggest you to do. This is a good exercise. So you then will see that just taking two level system spinor allows you to manipulate these two level system by applying certain protocol not necessarily continuous, you can apply some kicks and as a result you have a dynamic dynamics of unit vector unit vector means that n square is equal to 1 <coughs> which lives in the block sphere the object which was discussed extensively in a talk of Professor Zoller so this actually is nice exercise connection between what I was started telling you about dynamics and monetization leading to the block sphere and dynamics of a two-level system which is not necessarily electron and magnetic field is, necess is not necessarily the magnetic field the two-level system can be specially prepared polarized states of phot photons and synthetic magnetic field can be anything which mimics behavior of true magnetic. For example, one can play with electric field in a system of double quantum dots, which will produce the very same Hamiltonian and therefore will result in the very same behavior. So this is the qubit, and this is how the dynamics of qubit is described. So magnetic field is time dependent. Okay. So we start with local theory of magnetism. <coughs> so we will be dealing with almost the same Hamiltonian, now time independent. This is magnetization times magnetic field. I'm going to discuss thermodynamics. Yeah. Um, first of all, let me repeat it again that magnetism is a quantum phenomenon and it is associated either with spin degrees of freedom, which is entirely quantum number, or with the quantization of the orbital motion. <coughs> Saying semi classics, um, well, the magnetization is related to spin. This is due to new ball spin. We will assume that spin is large. This is a semi-classical condition. So spin is much larger than 1. And therefore, if you write down commutation relations for spin operators, for example, S plus, S minus is equal to 2 Z, and assume that s square is s times s plus 1, which is s square plus s, 
under this condition, we can neglect term S compared to S squared. So this is approximately S squared. S is very large. If I divide this commutation relation by S squared, what I will get? That S plus divided by S, S minus divided by S, commutator is equal to 1 over S, 2 SZ divided by S. So you see that <coughs> if I take large S limit, the right hand side of the commutator goes to zero. We see that in the limit of very large quantum number, the plus and minus component of spin operator are commuting. So they can be represented in terms of bosons. And this is what you did with Professor Nersesian when you discussed Halstein Primakov. So this is a way to construct large um, S theory. So therefore, in this semi-classical limit, let me first assume that magnetization is kind of classical vector. So I, I will write down expressions in spherical coordinate system. So mx is m um, sinus theta cosine phi, my is m sinus theta sinus phi, and mz is m cos theta. So once again, I'm talking about very simple Hamiltonian of spins which do not interact. There is no interaction between spins. They only talk to magnetic field, external magnetic field, applied to the system. Once again, I will take the magnetization axis Z along the direction of magnetic field. And therefore, my Hamiltonian H is minus M H cosine T. Okay? This is as simple as that. As I said, M is considered as a classical vector. Classical. Um, what I'm going to do now, I would like to compute the average magnetization along the direction V. So your system is magnetized by a magnetic field um, as a thermodynamic average. So I have an ensemble which don't talk. So and as a result, the magnetization, average magnetization is so it's average integral over d solid angle omega e to the power, sorry, mz e to the power minus h over temperature. I'm taking average, assuming that there is a Gibbs ensemble, divided by integral over solid angle omega e minus h over temperature. So, d omega is sinus theta d theta d phi. And what we have in denominator, this, is nothing but partition function. So z is integral over the omega e to the power minus h over temperature. So once again, I consider the Boltzmann constant. So I measure temperature in the units of energy. This is a conversion rule. So let's proceed with this simple calculation. Let me compute z is equal to integral from 0 to pi sinus theta d theta, integral from 0 to 2 pi d phi, 
and I have e to the power plus m h cosine theta divided by temperature. Okay, this is the integral I'm going to compute. It's very simple. Nothing depends on phi. Therefore, I write 2 pi. Then I take a change of variables. I will denote a new variable cosine theta is equal to x. Therefore, in a standard way, this is integral from minus 1 to 1 dx. Because this is d minus cosine theta. And this is m h x over temp. So then I will make this integral dimensionless. I will multiply it by m h over temperature and divide it by m h. Therefore, I have 2 pi times temperature over m h integral from minus m h over temperature to m h over temperature dy e to the power plus y. <coughs> where I denote new variable, this one, as one. Nothing can be more simple than the integral of exponential function. So I have 2 pi t divided by mh. And here I have exponent to the power mh over temperature minus exponent to the power minus mh over temperature. I will divide 2 and multiply it by 2. So therefore, I have 4 pi temperature over mH times sinus hyperbolicus mH over temperature. This is a partition function. Okay? What is the numerator? The numerator, namely integral over d omega m cosine theta e to the power m h cosine theta over temperature. Okay? Clearly that this is temperature times d over dh over z. Let me differentiate z. So this is integral over d omega e to the power m h cosine theta over temperature. I differentiate with respect of h. I get m cosine theta divided by temperature. So this is very simple. So instead of computing numerator explicitly, which is not a big deal, of course, I will take a derivative of this expression. Yeah. Z. And of course, mz is equal to numerator t d over d h z divided by z. So this is d over d h t log Z. So you see that this is free energy. I'm using very standard notations. Okay. T D over DH Z is equal to temperature times D over DH. I have a product 4 pi T divided by m h sinus h m h over temperature. So I differentiate first term temperature times minus 4 pi t over m h square sinus hyperbolicus m h over temperature plus 4 pi T over m h times cosine thermolicus m h over temperature times m over temperature. 
So therefore, this is, um, uh, I will take Yeah. M four pi T over M H out of the brackets. Um so what I have here I have M over temperature times cosine hyperbolicus m h over temperature minus um, 4 pi over h I have temperature over h times sinus hyperbolicus m h over temperature Did I not miss anything? Okay. Is it correct what I have written? T over H M over temperature. Yeah. Okay. I will now divide numerator by denominator, so M Z. Let us see. Let us see. So I have what I don't like is this extra temperature, which I have here. Um, this is what I'm, I'm saying. I have temperature in front and here this temperature cancels out, right? 4 pi temperature, so there is no temperature here. Yeah. So this is what, what I meant. Uh, yeah. Because here the temperature is cancelled out. Yeah. So now I divide and what I have is I have M cotangent MH over temperature minus temperature over H. Okay, so I will write it that way. So this is M times cotangent MH over temperature minus T over MH. Good. Um, and I will call this function L over MH over temperature. This function has a name. This is a Langevin function. I will write it down again. So, what I got is that MZ is equal to M Langevin function over M H over M. This is the calculation, very simple calculation. I don't know, did you discuss Langevin function in your course of statistical physics? So, Langevin function. is very simple. Lx is cotangent hyperbolicus x minus 1 over x.
And let's discuss properties of this function. In a minute, we will plot it. So, first of all, behavior of this function if x goes to 0. We tailor expand. So, expansion of cotangent is 1 over x plus x over 3 minus, well, I remember because this, I use this x cube over 45, you can check it, minus 1 over x, so the singularity cancels out, for small x this function behaves as x over 3, so it's linear. Second, we see that this function is odd function. And then we see that this function is bounded from below and bounded from above. Let's discuss what happened for very large x. <coughs> so cotangent is e to the power x minus plus x to the power minus x divided to the x x minus e to the power minus x. This is a cotangent minus 1 over x, which we have as a second term. I will write it, I will multiply it, numerate and denominate it by e to the power uh, minus x. So this is 1 plus e to the power minus 2x divided by 1 minus e to the power minus 2x minus 1 over x. So you see that the leading term is 1 because I can now tailor expand, assuming that I'm tailor expanding in a variable which is exponent to the power minus x. Then I have this power law term, which is minus x. And then I have two exponential term, minus 2x. And so on and so forth. So, and using this property, I have low bound and upper bound. So my function is actually behaving like that. So this is Lx, this is x, This is plus 1, and this is minus 1. And it is linear at the origin. OK? Good. Yeah. We can, of course, expand susceptibility in the limit of very small argument, which means high temperature. And what I will get that if H goes to zero, then MZ using this expansion is equal to M times one third MH over temperature. So this is one third M squared h over temperature. Okay, let me define now this acceptability. See that nothing can be simpler than what I'm doing. So, susceptibility, chi, and since I'm talking about non interacting particles, this is a limit. This is n of v, so which is number of moments <coughs> per unit volume. I'm discussing susceptibility per unit volume, and this is a limit of h goes to zero, mz divided by h. So this is a response function. You apply a magnetic field and see how much it is magnetized. Okay. So. I use that, take 
plug it in here, H cancels out, now I'm fine to take the limit. So this is equal to, I will denote a node as number of spin per unit volume. So this is a node M square divided by 3T. So the susceptibility of <coughs> spin system subject to apply magnetic field actually chi node is some constant divided by temperature it's a thermodynamic quantity so you see that this susceptibility known as Curie susceptibility is diverging at low temperatures at temperature it goes down to zero and this is characteristic for system of non-interacting local moments. I remind you that in one of our very first lectures we discussed susceptibility of itinerant um, electron gas. The ground state of fermions is a thermosphere, and what we obtain that susceptibility of free electron gas is basically constant divided by Fermi energy plus very small temperature corrections of the order of temperature square to the Fermi energy square. So here we have local moments. Um, and therefore, what we discovered is that the susceptibility is diverging as one of the temperature. Let's now make yet another step, which is very important. Assume that we consider our local moments And let's take one particular moment, for example, this one, and see which magnetic field acts to this moment. So we write each effective, which consists of external magnetic field. This is this one. Plus, since some other moments are magnetized, it will produce field, they will produce field, proportional to magnetization of a system. So I will just write some coefficient gamma times mz. Well, I select one, so the field magnetization produced by all but one, I'm talking about 10 to the power 23 particles, is the same. So this concept actually, firstly introduced in theory of magnetism, is known as a concept of molecular field. So you have effective field which consists of external plus some back action. So if it is so, let me plug in this effective field into the equation for magnetization. So mz is equal to m times Langevin function of m H external plus gamma mz over temperature. So the constant gamma is phenomenological. Uh, Monday we will connect it with some microscopic parameter. Gamma just, gamma just proportionality coefficient be between induced magnetization and its contribution to effective magnetic field. Um, well, what I can do now, I can turn off my external magnetic field, right? And then I have self-consistent molecular equation, which contains magnetization in the left-hand side, and it contains uh, magnetization in the right-hand side. So, mz is equal to m times Langevin function m gamma mz divided by temperature. And let's try to solve this equation in a very simple manner. We will find a graphical solution of this equation. So let me first multiply left-hand side and the right-hand side of this equation by m gamma 
of a temperature. So what I have is M gamma Mz of a temperature is equal to M squared gamma of a temperature, right? Um, because I'm multiplying by M gamma of a temperature, Langevin function over M gamma Mz over temperature. Now I denote this variable as x, so this is the same as here, and what I have is temperature over m square gamma x is equal to lambda x. So I have a line with a slope which is proportional temperature and inversely proportional to gamma, and I have a Langevin function which I already plotted. Suppose the temperature is high enough compared to something which we will define in a minute. So high temperature limit. So this is the line which is crossing my Langevin function. I have only one root of this equation which is zero. Um, and suppose now I take slope smaller, still one solution, and then I take slope here, where I still have one solution, but my tangential coincides with, tangen with the slope of the curve. I will define that this one, this one, is a temperature larger than Tc, this is temperature equal to Tc, and what happened then, if I load down the temperature again, I will have two roots, two non-trivial solution of my equation. So this is temperature smaller than Tc. What is Tc? As I said, the condition for Tc is that the slope of my line is equal to slope of tangential. Therefore, Tc divided by m square gamma x is equal to x over 3. So therefore, Tc is equal to m square gamma over 3. So, what I see here, that I have spontaneous symmetry breaking. My average monetization actually appears for small temperatures, smaller than Tc, and equal to zero for large temperatures, temperatures larger than Tc. So this resembles me what happens with superconductor. While here I don't have a um, complex parameter or the parameter, but just have a vector. <coughs> but there is a spontaneous magnetization which appears in the system below critical temperature. Besides, I can use this equation and identify the behavior of my magnetization in the vicinity of critical temperature. So how to do that? I will write what I did before. So temperature over m square gamma um, and from um, this equation m square gamma is just a three critical temperature. So this is one third T over Tc times x. This is the left hand side. And in the right hand side I will write x over 3 minus x cube over 45. So I can cancel the left hand side, cancel, divide the left hand side and right hand side by x. And what I get, actually 3x, that t over tc is equal to 1 minus x square over 15. And you remember that my x is proportional to magnetization, therefore from this equation I obtain that x is equal to square root over 15 tc tc minus t over tc 
I define this parameter as tau and plug it in what was here. So my magnetization, which is m gamma over, sorry, this is t uh, x over m gamma, I can multiply by m and divide by m. So this is then m square gamma is 3 uh, tc. So this is x over 3 m t over tc. And I plug in x from what I have found. So what I did is I showed that magnetization goes to zero continuously and it behaves at the vicinity of critical temperature as a square root of parameter tau, where parameter tau is t minus tc over tc. Again, it's in full accordance with the Landau theory of second order phase transition and with what we discussed for superconductors. Okay. Summarizing, what we obtain in very simple semi-classical theory of um, the ferromagnetism is that there is a critical temperature below which the system undergoes through sp spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, the magnetization along z direction because we turn on a little bit field and then we drop it off so we create a direction in which the symmetry is going to be breaking um, and below this temperature there is non-zero order parameter uh, which is um, magnetization so the transition to magnetized state we have uniform magnetization is the second order phase transition. You can actually use this Hamiltonian compute free energy, I showed you how to do it, and derive Landau function just explicitly from this theory. Show that this lambda phi to the 4 theory is applicable to this transition. You can get it from the very simple Hamiltonian. The last thing which I'm going to do now, I'm to compute the acceptability of this system. So susceptibility chi is n node and now I have to be careful. This is limit h external goes to zero. My magnetization mz divided by h external. I use my Langevin equation and say that I know that both external field goes to zero and induced magnetization goes to zero. Therefore, the argument of Langevin function is small. So this is a limit over h external goes to zero. And I have here m over 3. And I replace the function by its argument, which is m h external over temperature plus m gamma m z over temperature. So therefore, in the first term, sorry, and I have to divide by external field. The first term is very simple. I can divide by external field and take the limit, it goes to zero. So this is m square n node divided by three temperature. This is the same Curie's acceptability which I obtained before. So this is chi node. And the second term is plus n node. Um, I have m square gamma over 3 temperature and I have limit 
H external goes to zero and MZ divided by H external. So let me write it this way. So this is precisely chi, which I have in the first line of my equation. So this is chi. And therefore, I have equation which says that chi is equal to chi node plus um, m squared gamma over 3 is a Tc, right? So I have Tc over T times chi. Very simple equation which I can solve and find that chi is equal to chi node 1 minus Tc over T. And if I plug in that Curie's acceptability, chi node is a constant divided by temperature, I have a constant divided by temperature minus Tc. So this acceptability let me plot inverse susceptibility chi minus 1 it goes to 0 at the point of critical temperature this susceptibility is known as a Curie Weiss susceptibility So we see that the susceptibility is diverging when we approach to critical temperature. And the question is, what happens if we are below critical temperature? What the susceptibility is equal to? Any, any answer? It's equal to infinity, right. Because we, the magnetization is already formed. We can apply zero field, but it corresponds to finite magnetization, and therefore the susceptibility below Tc is equal to infinity. Uh, by the way, um, as I told you, and next Wednesday, when I'm not going to be here, Jean-Paul Fayet uh, will give a tutorial to you, and he will discuss a um, kind of summary of phase transition theory, introduce your critical indexes, this critical index beta, which characterizes how all the parameter goes to zero when temperature is approaching to critical, is equal to one half. <coughs> now we found yet another critical index, which is gamma, which tells you how the response function susceptibility uh, behaves if temperature goes to critical temperature. So the susceptibility should diverge because what happens is we will discuss it Monday in terms of correlation lens um, and discuss very simple Arstein's Cernicke theory of ferromagnet. Um, so what happens that actually susceptibility diverges means that the correlation lens diverges, um, it becomes infinity and when it becomes infinity the long range order is established. So relation length becomes equal to size of your sample, and this is a point where phase transition um, occurs. So the critical index gamma, so this is tau to the power minus gamma, and gamma is equal to 1. This is yet another critical index uh, for Landau phase transition theory. <coughs> okay. Are there any questions regarding to this semi-classical theory? Because what I'm going to do now in the remaining 40 or so minutes, I will repeat almost all calculations assuming that I'm in quantum limit. So what's the difference between classical limit and quantum limit? In classical or semi-classical limit, I consider it my magnetization um, as a vector which lives on the block sphere. In the quantum limit, I will assume that spin or total moment is operator. Uh, it corresponds to quantized levels um, of energy, um, quantized eigenvalue of um, uh, uh, moment in the z-direction, z-projection of, of the moment. Um, and everywhere, instead of taking integral 
of a solid angle of a sphere, I will take discrete summation of uh, states with a projection. So I will derive a little bit different equations with a little bit different functions. But you will see that almost everything what I said about behavior of ferry magnets in semi-classical limit will be reproduced in the quantum limit as well. Okay? <coughs> I will probably leave this because it's very instructive. That way. I thought you should have discussed something like that in statistical mechanics, did you? Yeah. But how then you didn't know, you don't know what the Langevin function is? Mm -hmm. But you had this function, cotangent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you discuss brilliant function? Mm -hmm. ah, okay. Um, good. So, quantum version. So, H is again minus M times H. I'm going to compute thermodynamic um, quantity. Um, and um, MZ is related to, well, before coming to average, let me write that total magnetization is associated with total momentum in the system, where J is sum of orbital momentum plus spin, and GJ is the lambda factor, which I already briefly discussed um, during last lecture, or geomagnetic ratio. This is 1 plus J, J plus 1 minus L, L plus 1 plus S, S plus 1 divided by 2 J, J plus 1. So we have two important cases. If our magnetization consists only of spin and there is no orbital motion, so if L is equal to zero, so then J is equal to S and GS is equal to one plus S, S plus one, plus s s plus 1 minus 0 divided by 2 s s plus 1 so this is 1 plus 1 this is equal to 2 so if magnetism is related to spin degree then your general magnetic ratio is equal to 2 if however we have s equal to 0 and therefore j is equal to l we have magnetism associated with orbital motion so this lambda factor is equal to 1 plus L L plus 1 minus L L plus 1 divided by 2 L L plus 1 and therefore G L is equal to 1. Okay? So therefore MZ is equal, now I will drop index J, I will just write G mu bar J, Z. And J, as I said, is quantum mechanical operator the same way as we discussed for orbital moment or spin. Um, the eigenvalues are quantized um, and J, Z operator takes to j plus 1 eigenvalues. So this is minus j minus j plus 1 j. So there are 
two g plus one, and therefore g z average is just discrete sum over m equal to minus j to j um, m e to the power of minus h over temperature divided by my particle function which is sum from m equal to minus j j there are two j plus one uh, terms um, e to the power minus h over temperature okay and then the magnetization is given by this equation um, and this is the Hamiltonian um, so H is equal to minus G mu bar H J Z which is M right times h so let me start with the calculation of partition function so partition function is then sum over m equal to minus j to j e to the power plus g mu bar h over temperature times m i will denote this variable this combination is x so i have sum over m equal to minus j to j e to the power m x which is e to the power minus j x plus e to the power minus j minus 1 x plus and so on forth to the power j x this is geometric progression i will take out e to the power minus j x as you remember i have two j plus one terms um, and what i have i have one plus e to the power x plus e to the power uh, two j x I have a finite sum of geometric progression. We know what it is. If you don't know, I just multiply numerator and denominator by 1 minus e to the power x. 1 minus e to the power x. And what I have here, I have i minus j x. And I have here, therefore, 1 minus e to the power 2j plus 1. So this is sum of geometric progression. Okay, so let me massage it a little bit because everything else is going to be straightforward. So z is equal to e to the power minus j x minus e to the power j plus 1 x divided by 1 minus e to the power x. I will flip the sign in numerator and denominator. I will write it as e to the power x half. Here I have e to the power x half minus e to the power minus x half. And I will take out e to the power x half um, uh, therefore it's e to the power uh, j plus one half x minus e to the power minus j plus one half x okay What I have in denominator is twice the sinus hyperbolicus of x half. What I have in the numerator is a twice of sinus hyperbolicus of j plus one half x. 
So I have sinus hyperbolicus j plus one half x divided by sinus hyperbolicus x. Let me see that I didn't make any mistake. No, I didn't. So then, then the numerator with sum over m equal to minus j to j m e to the power mx, right? This is what I have in numerator is nothing but d over dx z. <coughs> I computed denominator. Now I will compute the numerator taking derivative of partition function with respect to x. Okay, I have um, j plus one half cosinus hyperbolicus j plus one half x times sinus hyperbolicus x over two minus one half cosine hyperbolicus x over two sinus hyperbolicus j plus one half x divided by sinus hyperbolicus square x over two. Let me now write one over z, and this will be my average. This is one over z, right? And I will write down z here, sinus hyperbolicus j plus one half x divided by sinus hyperbolicus, therefore I remove one power there. Good. I have some expression. which tells me that my g z average is equal to um, the first term is j plus one half cotangent hyperbolicus j plus one half x um, and the second term is minus one half cotangent hyperbolicus x over two so let me write down it this way that I take out j and what remains is 1 plus 1 over 2j I also denote jx is equal to y Therefore, I have cotangent hyperbolicus uh, 1 plus 1 over 2j y minus 1 over 2j um, and cotangent hyperbolicus y over 2j. So, I denote this function as a brilliant function j with index j of y. And my equation for the magnetization, so I told you that magnetization mz is g mu bar jz. Therefore, it is equal to g mu bar j times brilliant fun bj. Um, x, if you remember, was m, sorry, x was g mu bar h divided by temperature, um, therefore this is g mu bar j h over temperature. This is my equation.
okay? The Brillouin function. What is it? By the way, if we if we take a semi-classical limit of this quantum um, uh, calculations, you may replace your summation by integration, and you will be basically end up with Langevin function. We will see how we can get it. So brilliant function B j y is equal to 1 plus 1 over 2 j cotangent 1 plus 1 over 2 j y minus 1 over 2 j cotangent hyperbolicus y over 2 j. Let's discuss properties of this function. And as I said, property number one, if we take j very large, what do we get? So if j goes to infinity, this term is one. Uh, so this is cotangent hyperbolicus y minus. With this term, we should be careful because j is here and there. Therefore, we Taylor expanded. This is 2j. The first term of expansion is 2j over y. 2j cancels out. This is 1 over y. So this is a Langevin function. Okay? So the brilliant function in the limit of very large argument coincides with the Langevin function, which we used before uh, for the semi-classical theory of magnitude. Property number two, for finite j, of course you can take extreme quantum limit, j is equal to one half. There will be only two terms here and two terms there. Please do this exercise and actually be sure that in the most quantum case uh, of spin one half, your brilliant, brilliant function is just tangent hyperbolicus. You can compute it directly. So m takes value plus one half and minus one half, and as a result, you have exponent minus exponent, and exponent plus exponent. This is tangent hyperbolicus. Um, so b j minus y is equal to minus b j y. Your function is a combination of two odd functions, therefore, it's also odd function of its argument. Um, number three. Let's take limit bj for arbitrary. I'm not taking semi-classic limit anymore. If y goes to 0, what do we have? We need to expand. So this is 1 plus 1 over 2j. I have uh, 1, 1 plus 1 over 2j y plus y over 3, 1, 1 plus 1 over 2j. I'm not going to keep the next term because I'm only interested in the linear term. Minus 1 over 2j. 2j over y plus 1 third y over 2j. So as you see that this term is 1 over y and this term is also 1 over y. It cancels out, and what we have in total is y over 3. It's 1 plus 1 over 2j square minus 1 over 2j square. So therefore, it is equal to y over 3, 1 plus 1 over j. So this is equal to y over 3 j plus 1 divided by j. This is important. And property number 4, I'm not going to prove it, but you can also analyze uh, behavior of this function at y goes to infinity. And therefore, you will get that this is also bounded from below and bounded from the above. You have two cotangent 
with linear. Okay, let's compute susceptibility in a Curie regime. So we just consider quantum moments subject to external magnetic field. <coughs> so susceptibility chi node is n node limit over h external goes to zero mz divided by h external is equal to n node limit g mu bar h external goes to zero g mu bar j um, times brilliant function j g mu bar j h external over temperature divided by h external with this expansion it's equal to a node limit g mu bar j divided by h external and now I replace the argument times one third g mu bar j h external over temperature times j plus one divided by j h external goes to zero so h external cancels out j cancels out and what we have is n node times g mu bar square times j times j plus 1 divided by 3 times temperature. If you remember, in semi-classical theory, we have m square here. So correct transformation from classical limit to quantum is to replace m square, which is magnetization square, by the Casimir operator, which is j square, which is jj plus 1. Again, we didn't make any mistake. We obtain correct correspondence between classical and quantum mechanical, um, quantum mechanical description. So what we see here is that it's indeed Curie flow. So the susceptibility behaves as one over temperature and diverges um, as um, one over temperature. Okay. Um, now, let's apply the same concept of molecular field, which I um, erased. However, if we replace by the action of all other moments but one by its molecular field average correspondence, then we get equation that average magnetization is equal to g mu bar j um, and I have a brilliant function bj of uh, g mu bar j gamma m z divided by m. This is a molecular field equation which describes behavior of magnetization. I can do pretty the same as I did before. Namely, I will plot the brilliant function. This will be the same brilliant function j for given j. It will have the very same form or similar form. And I will analyze of my curve. So I will denote this parameter as y and I will see that non-trivial solution of this equation 
which has always a trivial solution, but in addition, there are two non-trivial solutions which appear at temperatures below the critical temperature. So let's compute the critical temperature. which is given by the slope. So at Tc, I have magnetization Mz is equal to G mu bar J. I replace a Brillouin function by um, its argument. So this is one third G mu bar J Mz over temperature times j plus 1 over j. j cancels out, so this is Tc. Magnetization cancels out, and therefore I obtain that the critical temperature is g mu bar square over 3 j j plus 1. Again, I replaced m square by j, j plus 1, and I have a correspondence between classical and quantum system. So, in the spirit of Landau theory, what happens is that your free energy functional f as a function of mz just has a minimum at the origin, however, below Tc, you have spontaneous symmetry breaking, um, and you have two other minima, which corresponds to true minima of free energy, um, and which give you spontaneous symmetry breaking and magnetization. Again, take the simple Hamiltonian, which um, I consider it for quantum limit, and derive the Taylor expansion for the free energy as a function of magnetization along the z-direction for quantum case and show that this is indeed the Landau function. Okay? <coughs> so we obtain Curie law. Now let's obtain Curie Weiss law. So we will define magnetization chi, which is n node limit over mz divided by h external if h external goes to zero. And with the very same way we did it before, we will obtain that chi 1 minus Tc over T is equal to chi node, and therefore chi is equal to chi node divided by 1 minus Tc over T, which is a constant over T minus Tc. We have the very same behavior of quantum system as it is described for classical system. <coughs> okay. I think now you have almost everything to uh, solve on your homework, um, I don't remember what was exactly there, but I also suggest you for semi-classical and quantum limit compute, for example, mx average and my average and m square average. Then you will understand better technique how it is done. So both in semi-classical in a quantum regime and basically that's all what I plan to tell you today. Are there any questions? During our, our lecture with this with spin waves in our sessions last week, you told Stan Primakov to transform the spin operators into bosonic operators. Is there a way to transform the spin operators into fermionic operators? Yeah, yeah. there are uh, such ways. Um, uh, and there there are several ways uh, to do it, so um, as we discussed that spins algebra does not satisfy, neither satisfies fermionic on bosonic, um, so 
what you did with the Halstein Primakov um, is exactly utilizing community um, S plus S minus is equal to 2 Sz. And therefore, um, you said that S plus is operator B, bosonic operator, and S minus is operator B dagger. So you have this commutation, um, which is almost zero in the semi-classical uh, limit. You, you define bosonic um, operators. Um, and then uh, you actually describe um, Sz, um, Sz um, in terms of uh, S square. So um, um, the way it is done for Halstein Primakov, that S square is S, S plus 1 is equal to S uh, X square plus S Y square plus S Z square. This is something like S plus S minus. So this is B, B dagger. And therefore, you can write that S Z will be square root um, of um, S S plus 1 minus, uh, say, B dagger B, something like that. This is Halstein Primakov. Um, uh, in principle, there is also a presentation which is called uh, Malayev Dyson, uh, because here Sz is square root and actually it's expansion in terms of density of bosonic operator. But in Malayev Dyson, um, actually this expression for Z, which is also representation in terms of bosons, is quite simple. But expression of S plus, S S minus is not that simple, and moreover, it's um, a bit twisted representation. It doesn't look Hermitian from the very beginning, but who cares? Um, um, about fermions, in principle, you can write down that S is one half fermionic operator F dagger alpha, sigma alpha beta, F beta. You can check that um, here, introducing spin in terms of fermionic operators, you have four possible states. So you have one side, um, and on this side, you can zero fermions, you can have one fermion, or you can have two fermions. Um, so you can, say, you can see that with this representation, you satisfy um, the algebra of spin operators also. Um, for example, um, operator S plus will be F dagger up, F down. S minus will be F dagger down, F up. And Sz would be one half uh, F dagger up, F up, minus F dagger down, F down. However, you extend it to Hilbert space, introducing by two new states, namely empty and double occupied. So in principle, um, you should take care of getting rid of these states. Um, it can be done in different ways. Um, uh, for example, it can be done by adding to your um, Hamiltonian terms, which is lambda n minus 1. Uh, let me first, so minus. This will be done like chemical potential to your Hamiltonian. And then um, if n is equal to 2, you have lambda over temperature. You put lambda equal to infinity, and you project out the states. Lambda equal to 0, and equal to 0 has a 0 eigenvalues. You can prove that it will not give a contribution to calculation of your partition function. But in principle, you can also add term n minus 1 square you will recognize that this is precisely Hubbard term, then the empty state and double occupied states will be excluded on a general footing. Um, um, uh, and this is a way to fermionize your spin period. Um, uh, besides, for those who are curious, I can uh, say that if we are talking about spin one half operator, uh, but they are already, so to say, fermions. This, uh, this famous Majorana fermions, um, because the Pauli matrices um, anti-commute, sigma alpha, sigma beta, anti-commutator is equal to delta alpha beta. So in a sense, Pauli matrices for spin one half are already fermions. 
So one can construct a fermionic basis um, not in terms of complex fermions which satisfy U1 gauge invariance. One can make a phase transformation, gauge transformation with the phase. But with the fermions which satisfy discrete, which satisfy, which is subject to discrete trim, Z2, which are Majorana. That's about ways to. There are many representations, um, um, and um, of course, these representations are done um, in connection with a way to develop many body <coughs> uh, perturbation theory, uh, and in particular, diagrammatic techniques, um, and proceed with calculations of many body effects. Um, um, so sometimes, bosonic representation, of course, um, have advantage. Um, uh, for systems um, uh, for description of effects associated with behavior of magnons, magnon dumping. However, bosonic representation has a disadvantage that the Hilbert state, as we discussed, for bosonic system is infinite. It's not bounded. Uh, fermionic representation is, um, has more advantage in description of strongly current systems, uh, behavior of spin liquids, which we will touch on our very last lecture on Friday next week. Um, um, yeah, but of course, uh, when you discuss physical phenomena, it's just a matter of convenience which representation you use, um, and uh, the physical answer should not depend on the way you construct your uh, scheme of calculations. Other questions? Okay, then see you on Monday. I'm wondering if you discuss it in statistical physics, I mean, this Langevin and all stuffs and behavior spin, how did you avoid discussing phase transitions? No, we discussed phase transitions. But how can you dis You told me that you don't know anything about Landau theory or whatever. We don't know Landau theory, but we discussed that particular case. We discussed the concept behind phase transition, but not like the expansion of the free energy in terms of A and B. Only a period. He only showed us that it could be expanded, but we didn't deal with how to solve the coefficients for A and B. Neither one important on the symmetry to the Landau theory. But you see that there are everything is so universal. We discuss superconductors. We found this universal description in terms of all the parameters. We discuss magnets. Um, if you discuss Isenk model, then this is probably what you did. You will uh, introduce color or the parameter, which is just because you have a z direction, then it will be directly uh, theory lambda phi to the four. I will ask Jean Paul also to discuss um, the fluctuations with you and the way uh, to define. Did you discuss what is upper critical dimension? That what are the fluctuations? We will. I will introduce you fluctuations in simple Einstein theory on Monday, and then Jean Paul will proceed. How I hope. Uh, with the simple calculations of corrections to specific heat um, because of fluctuations, and you will find out that in all dimensions above four, for example, for simple Einstein Cernke theory, uh, these corrections are negligible. So this is a mean field theory which we are discussing, are perfectly describing um, uh, systems with the, which are above certain dimension, which with this for this particular um, theory will be four. So this four is. Um, upper critical dimension. However, for um, dimensions below four, we are living in three-dimensional world. There are some corrections. Um, um, so um, this correction can be taken into account. Uh, well, these corrections are, of course, small in the domain of applicability of Landau theory, which is above Ginsburg number, which but become very important if you approach very close to the transition point for magnets. By the way, Ginsburg number is of the order of 10 to the power, power minus 1. So this is not that small like 10 to the power minus 12 as for superconductors. So crit critical fluctuations are important at certain temperatures and change behavior. But then there, there is another way to describe the system which is called scaling. Um, let's see how, how much Jean-Paul will be able to 
tell you on Wednesday, but the universality is very important um, property and uh, there are universal uh, to describe physics uh, of in the vicinity of phase transition, but as probably Professor Nersisian told you, um, the course, the basic course of phase transition theory would probably contain like 10 lectures in order to show some basic things. Uh, but we don't have luxury of that. Um, I decided to devote one tutorial for completely just for discussion of phase transitions. I hope you also heard something in other courses and as I said we repeatedly did it for superconductivity for magnetism. Okay. See you.